All right, Alice, so this video mainly talks about Persia, but I wanted to briefly talk about the colonization period in ancient Greece. And the reason why I put this in this video is because this is going to be one of the main reasons why the Greeks and the Persians come into conflict with one another. We already discussed the location of the Greek city-states. Now the Persian Empire is located to the east of that. But as you can see in this map, the Greeks eventually are going to start to colonize and settle in areas far beyond their original location of the city-states. Now the reason why this matters is because the other societies that existed there are going to sometimes clash with the Greeks. Um, this does have a lasting cultural effect as well. We already know that through trade, the Greek city-states were certainly exposing some of their ideas to the Mediterranean world. So that's probably a more positive impact, just the idea that Greek culture is going to be exposed to also areas that they colonize. It's negative, though, in the sense that the people that don't like the Greeks uh, in these places are eventually going to fight them. So arguably, this colonization effort is going to set up some of the tension that's eventually going to lead to their decline. Okay, so these colonies started around the 8th century BCE. The reason why the colony started in general, sort of similar to the reason why the Americans began, or rather, Europeans began to colonize in America. Uh, most of the time you see colonies because you want additional resources. The place that you live is not adequate enough to feed your population. So by the 8th century BCE, the Greek population was growing sufficiently and they didn't have enough food to supply to their population. So one of the major reasons why they start to expand and settle in all these different places is that they can get food and bring it back to the Greek city-states. Um, so the population started to increase in general once that dark age period ended uh, and farmers just could not grow enough grain to feed everyone. So what we see is that some Greeks actually willingly moved to these new colonies. Others had to be coerced to do so. Sometimes they had, it was sort of like a lottery and the person who basically drew the short straw would be forced to move to one of these colonies. And the function of the colonies, partially, was to bring food back to the city-states. So for example, you know, these colonies that are here near Marseille in France, they would get things like grain and they would bring it back to the main city-states to make sure that, that population was well fed. The largest of the city-states uh, were in Italy. There was Syracuse and Agrigentum. Um, they were Syracuse, you can see here, on the island of Sicily, right? So these are some of the biggest of the Greek colonies. This also shows us one of the reasons why the Romans had such a cultural connection to the Greeks, because there were Greeks that were living in what eventually will become the Roman Empire. Um... Again, what we see is that these Greek colonies, because they are separated geographically from the Greek peninsula, they are going to essentially govern themselves, so they have a lot of political autonomy, but they maintain a shared culture with their home city-state. So, for example, a colony that was set up by the Spartans is still going to really focus on that military training, whereas a colony set up by Athens is going to be more in interested in education and intellectual thought and a democratic style of government. Um, so essentially what we see is that even as the Greek population expands in terms of where it is physically living, we do see that Greek culture itself is going to spread along with the population. We can see it essentially as a diaspora of Greek culture. So the Persians. Okay, so the Persians were located farther east when compared to the Greeks. Uh, the Persian Empire began in 559 BCE under the leadership of King Cyrus the Great. You see him up here. Uh, and Cyrus established the Persian Empire by conquering a lot of land that made up the Persian Empire. So I'll show you a map in a future slide, but he conquered the lands from the Aegean Sea. So that would be the eastern border of Greece. 
and he conquered land all the way to the western borders of India. So the Persian Empire was quite large in size. So essentially these areas he conquered made up northern Mesopotamia, Syria, Canaan, the Phoenician cities, Libya, and some of the Greek city-states that were in Asia Minor. So that's one of the reasons why the Greeks come into conflict with the Persians. They are uh, competing over land. Um, Cyrus did not completely conquer all the land that made up the Persian Empire. Cy uh, Cyrus's son, Cambyses, we see him here, he basically finished the job, and by the time his son finished his conquests, the Persian Empire essentially had the entire Middle East under its control. So basically once Egypt is added to Persian possessions, we're going to see that the Persian Empire combines three of the earliest societies that we saw in human history. So if we think about period one again, we can think about Mesopotamia, we can think about Egypt, and we can think about the Indus River Valley. All three of these are going to be part of the Persian Empire. So definitely a connection back to period one here. So the, uh, the Achaemenid Empire, um, well, the Persians in general. Let's let's just talk about their their land first before we get to uh, before we get to other specific leaders. Uh, so the Achaemenid Empire was another name for the earliest part of the Persian Empire. Uh, the size was tremendous. It stretched more than three thousand miles from the Nile all the way to the Indus River. The territory, by comparison, was almost as large as the United States. Now, this was the largest and most diverse empire that the world had seen up until this point. More than 35 million people lived in this area, and there were more than 70 distinct ethnic groups. So what it means to be Persian is difficult to define. There were people that spoke different languages, that had different religions, and that diversity is going to shape the way that the Persians govern themselves, which we'll examine pretty soon here. Okay, very important ruler of Persia was Darius I. Uh, he, like many ancient rulers that we've already talked about, so if we think about ancient Egypt or China back in period one, for example, Darius established power and proved his legitimacy through divine right. So again, he believed that it was God who actually gave him his authority to rule. Uh, his power is outlined by the way that he could govern such a large and diverse empire efficiently. If you think about how many other empires collapsed because they simply became too big, it's impressive to think about how long the Persians existed, and this all has to do with how they govern themselves. So really, we could talk about how the Persians formed an efficient bureaucracy. They used what's called the satrap system. Satraps were governors, essentially. Uh, they were appointed by King Darius and subsequent kings after that. And they ruled all the different provinces that were in Persia. You can see this map is a little small, but each of these little sections here are different provinces in Persia. We can think about a province sort of like a state. So the United States is one huge country, but we have 50 different states. That's what the provinces are like. So there was a satrap for each province. And this allowed the satraps to actually govern the provinces directly. But the satraps had to do what the emperor wanted them to do. So they weren't completely independent. But this is significant because the emperor obviously is not going to be able to travel to and directly rule every single part of an empire so large. So the satraps, if they were loyal, were very efficient at governing these more local regions. The other thing that the bureaucracy contained was an inspector system. These inspectors were hired, again, directly uh, through the emperor, so they were hired in the capital, and their job was to go to the different provinces and make sure that the satraps were doing their jobs. So it was sort of like an accountability position. Now, this is a really good example of bureaucracy because you see that the government is divided into various departments in order to become more efficient. Some bureaucracies we see become overly complex. This was one of the ways that the 
Persian Empire could be as successful as it was. They divided up power to make it easier to govern. So Darius is also well known for improving the economy of Persia and establishing infrastructure that helped facilitate trade and make the Persian Empire as wealthy as it was. The capital of the Persian Empire was established at Persepolis. So Persepolis is relatively central. Let's see if I can get a better picture of it. I just realized it's not located on that previous map. So here's Persepolis. So you can see that it's a really good location in terms of balancing out the Western and Eastern influence of the Persian Empire. Uh, in addition to establishing a very impressive royal palace at Persepolis, another very good example of infrastructure was the Royal Road. The Royal Road was over 1,500 miles long. I think it's actually closer to 1,700 miles long. And the purpose of the Royal Road was to facilitate trade, right? So we could compare it to something like the Silk Road from China. Uh, this, in addition to just making it easier for trade caravans to go from one side of the road to the other, uh, also set up, uh, set up a courier system, so like a postal service, essentially. And according to historical records, it could take as few as seven days for a piece of correspondence to go from one end of the Royal Road to another. We're talking about thousands of years ago, so the fact that it only took about a week for messages to go back and forth is very impressive. They also established caravanserai. They were like inns and markets, sort of, I mean, you could think of it as like a highway rest stop in a sense. It made it easier for people to travel this long distance because they could take stops along the way. They could trade and they also had places to sleep. So these caravanserai also made it so that these small cities would eventually crop up along the Royal Road in order to service the population that was trading along the road. Another really good economic contribution that Darius made was that he created a common currency. So all throughout the Persian Empire, they all used the same coinage. And this is just an image of, of coinage that was used in ancient Persia. Now, we all know, if you've traveled internationally ever, that having to exchange your currency can be a pain and it can be confusing. You're not quite sure how much the dollar is worth in a different country, and sometimes you can actually lose out. Sometimes your money isn't worth as much in a different currency, right? Uh, so by establishing a, a common currency throughout Persia, it made it much easier for people to trade. So one of the most distinguishing characteristics of the Persian society was that they were very tolerant. This is in a, both a religious and a cultural sense. So the Persians did not try to enforce religious or cultural uniformity in their empire. The reason why this is is because, as we discussed earlier, there were over 70 ethnic groups that, that lived in Persia. So if you had to enforce one particular culture or religion, it would be very difficult. There were so many different types of people and the economy was very successful. So the Persian rulers essentially figured that if they could be successful with such diversity, why change it? So Darius allowed all different types of ethnic groups to retain their cultural identity and live in Persia so long as they paid their taxes. Uh, and also they uh, all able-bodied men had to serve in the military. But as long as they did those two things, they could live freely in Persia. So this is very unusual for the time period. Sorry, that's a typo. For the time period, not timer. And uh, so this shows us that unlike places like Greece, unlike places like Egypt, you could actually develop your own unique identity culturally or religiously and still live in this city. A good example of a, a piece of art that actually represented this diversity was the Gate of All Nations, which was constructed under Xerxes, who was Darius's son. And the Gate of All Nations was meant to, um, was meant essentially to welcome people from various cultural backgrounds into the capital of Persepolis. What's ironic about this is that Xerxes, who used to be a more tolerant ruler in the early days of his reign, actually becomes less tolerant as time goes on. And that's one of the reasons for the Persian decline. So Persian religion, 
Uh, unlike the Greeks, we already talked about the polytheistic Greeks, the Persians were monotheistic. Their religion was called Zoroastrianism, which is one of the oldest monotheistic religions that exists in history. Zoroastrianism was developed from the teachings of the prophet Zarathustra, and Zarathustra lived approximately 660 to 583 BCE. Now, what's interesting is that they are monotheistic because they only worship one actual god. His name was Ahura Mazda. This is a representation of this god. He always looks sort of bird-like. But despite the fact that they only worship the one god, the Zoroastrians did believe that there were other gods. They just didn't worship them. So it's still technically monotheism because there's this one god that they abide by, uh, but there were other gods that existed. Under Zoroastrianism in the early stages, uh, the traditions, the ways of life, the beliefs were passed down orally by priests. The priests were called magi. But as time goes on, the Zoroastrian ideas were actually written down, and they were taught in texts called Avestas. <clears throat> now, Zoroastrianism is not very common anymore, but most of what used to be Zoroastrians, they are going to evolve later into another monotheistic religion. A lot of the people that were Zoroastrians, that lived in the geographic area that was Persia, are eventually going to adopt the monotheistic religion of Islam when that develops. So we'll talk about that when the time comes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So additionally, uh, we will see that Persian society is actually not too different from Greek society <clears throat> or other societies of the time period. There was considerable social stratification, so not everyone existed equally. Persia did have slaves, although according to historical record, they did not have as many slaves as the Greeks did, particularly the Spartans. Uh, but the slaves did work in similar jobs, so the, it really depended on where they lived. So if they lived in a more rural area, they tended to do agricultural work. If they lived in cities, they tended to do more domestic duties. Uh, and also, slaves could be owned directly by the government, and if they were, they oftentimes built infrastructure. So they would build the royal palace, they would build the royal road. Uh, so it, you could compare that, I guess, to the slaves uh, that built the pyramids of Egypt, for example. And just like the Greeks, and most societies for that matter, the Persians were patriarchal in nature, so men uh, were much more powerful. But Persian women were, uh, in general, slightly more empowered than Greek women, particularly Athenian women. As we know, Athenian women uh, did not have very many rights at all. Spartan women had more. So we do have evidence that uh, Persian women were able to own property. They could actually work and earn independent wages and keep those wages. They could divorce in certain circumstances. One thing that is sort of uh, complex is that many Persian women were veiled. Uh, nowadays, in societies where women wear veils, oftentimes it is seen as an example of patriarchy. The idea is that women are meant to cover themselves for modesty, right? Oftentimes to cover themselves if they're in public and they're, uh, and they're seen by men that are not their husbands or fathers. According to historical tradition, this may not have been chiefly a restriction of their rights. Some women wore veils at this time also to just represent what their social status was. But in any case, if we compare women in Persia to women in Greece, we could say that they're sort of in between Athenian women and Spartan women, maybe. They have some rights. They don't have universal rights. Uh, they don't have as very many political rights, but at the same time, economically, they could be somewhat independent. One of the most interesting, at least I think, uh, contributions to uh, the Persian economy was the irrigation systems that they develop. Now, as you probably know, this region of the world is quite dry, right? So you might think, how could they proliferate ag agriculture? Well, they did irrigate their fields, and this is not uncommon. We saw other examples, like in Egypt, for example, of irrigation. But they use a new system. They developed these underground canals that were called kanats. Uh, so the kanat system, you can see a diagram of it here. You don't have to have this memorized by any, any means. But what you see is that uh, they basically construct these canals that work with gravity. So they start at a higher, uh, higher level, above sea level, and they end up eventually leaving the underground to uh, irrigate the valley that is going to become a farm, right? But instead of going above ground, they dig these canals. The reason why this is really important for this region is because this is a very dry climate, and if they did not keep these canals underground, 
much of the water would evaporate before it reached its final destination. So the Kanat system is a pretty revolutionary technological achievement for the Persians. And what this does is it basically... Um, um, it basically starts to spread and develop, and kanats are going to become really common throughout the arid Iranian plateau of central Persia, so a really important technological contribution to the area. Okay, so those are that's sort of an outline of the Persians. I want to do a new video to talk about the Persian Wars. So basically what we're going to do here is we're going to combine our knowledge of Greece and Persia to understand why these two societies come in conflict with one another and how the end of that conflict is going to result in the future development of both Greece and Persia. So stay tuned for that.